Shopping. All attendees are in listen only mode. Okay. There's not attending. Oops. Oh, though. Yep. I forgot to send it. This webinar will focus on how to use self-advocacy through media and the internet. Our presenter is Beth Haller of Towson University in Maryland. Beth wrote a 2010 book on media and disability pictured below. Um, so Beth, did you want to go, go ahead and get started? Yes. Okay. Do you want to move to the next slide? Oh, yes. So let me talk a little about what we'll cover in this webinar. So the items that will be covered are choosing how you want to be a self-advocate, making a video may be the best way for you to be, become a self-advocate, how to use Facebook, how to use Twitter, how to use Pinterest, Instagram, or video blogs, how to use public service announcements, how to use Tumblr, and how to use online petitions for self-advocacy. Next. So how to choose whether you want to be a self-advocate or not. Um, pictured is Teddy Fitzmaurice, who sells disability rights and social justice t-shirts and buttons, and that's how he um, works as a self-advocate. He goes to conferences related disability and sells t-shirts and buttons with social justice and disability rights. So I think there's some a good list of things about being a self-advocate. So you can tell your personal story the way you want. Being your own advocate will make you feel good about yourself. Other disabled people who see your self-advocacy may decide to become self-advocates. If you're a self-advocate, no one speaks for you but you. This is rather than your parents, an organization, or the news media. No one is speaking for you but you. If you use social media, you can create privacy settings. These are so you are in control of whether someone can post on your page, friend you, follow you on Twitter, etc. If you use a website or blog, you can craft the message the way you want. You can make sure it says exactly what you want to say. But there are some bad things about being a self-advocate. You will become known to others. When you speak at events, the news media might cover your talk. You will not have a say in how they report that story about you. Not everyone will like what you have to say. They may be rude or even mean and angry in responding to you. If you use social media, you may receive mean or angry comments in posts or tweets. If you use websites or blogs, people who disagree with you may share them with mean or angry, share them with mean or angry comments or even lie about what you said. If you decide to become a self-advocate, here's some things you need to know about the media. So a lot more are using the internet to access television, news, everything that used to be TV is now online. And many people get their news from these organization websites. And sometimes they get them from Facebook and Twitter. Sometimes they look at these news um, stories on their phones. People do not read print newspapers much anymore. Fewer than one in four people in America read a print newspaper. Most people read news on the computer, tablet, or a smartphone. Many people still watch their news on television, but they're finding out about news from social media. Advocates need to know how to get in touch with journalists who can do stories about disability topics. This is so that they will have say in the news stories. There are some links in the online course about how the media has changed. I recommend those links. But, Next uh, slide. Okay. Sure. Sorry, am I on the correct slide? Is this the correct slide, Beth? Yes. Okay, thank you. So, now go to the next slide.
it has drew on it. Next, making video slide. Okay. So the, the, it's the making videos with the picture of Goldsmith on it. There you go. Okay. Thank you. Okay, making videos. Um, on this slide is a picture of Drew, He's an autistic teen who created the shot. How pity is. Drew is in the image. He's a Caucasian teen with light brown hair, wearing a blue t-shirt and jeans and typing on a tablet, sitting in a white chair next to a white side table. He's from Wisconsin 11. He created a short film called No Pity. This is because he didn't like his teacher donating to an autism charity that uses pity to raise money. He participated in the PBS Project Voice. A program to finish. There's a link on, on the, the train watch his film. Drew's information about when disability organizations or disability charities use pity to raise money. It shows how that method hurts disabled people. Quote from Drew, this is a disabled teenager's heartfelt appeal for respect and dig dignity always trumps pity. End quote. In addition, self-advocacy organizations around the country and around the world sometimes use videos to tell people about self-advocacy. Also on the slide is a um, screenshot of the self-advocacy pokey, the SA pokey, which is created by Rhode Island's 17th Annual Statewide Self-Advocacy Conference in 2012. It's a very fun video just talking about the importance of self-advocacy for self-advocates and how everyone around the world should be participating in self-advocacy if they want to um, do that. Ad Advocates for Action Rhode Island is an independent statewide nonprofit self-advocacy organization. It hosts this video on its website. It's an organization directed by and for people who have a developmental disability and they try to empower others who have DD so that they can speak up for themselves and for others. Remember, nothing about us without us because together we can make a difference. So videos are a very powerful way to get your message across. Next slide. So Facebook, everybody's using it these days and it's become a really excellent way for self-advocates to get their message out there. But it has both good and bad parts to it. Some of the good things about Facebook. Can talk to people who may not live near you via Facebook. Can look at pictures and videos that other people post. Can post your own pictures and videos. Can share the links, pictures and videos of others to your Facebook friends. You can tell everyone on Facebook about your life. There are more than one billion people around the world on Facebook. You can tell people about disability topics that are important to you. You can learn about what other disability self-advocates are doing. You can join a Facebook disability group and find people who are self-advocates like you. You can teach non-disabled people about disability through Facebook. You can get news general or disability related news on Facebook. You can see what disability organizations around the world are doing. Many self-advocates on Facebook use their pages to post disability news. Next slide. But there are some bad things about Facebook. Next slide. Here are some of the problems with Facebook. If you use a screen reader, it may not be able to read a Facebook page. There is work going on to try to make Facebook more accessible these days. If you don't like to write, it may be difficult to say what you want in a post on Facebook. 
You'll have to learn the privacy settings if you don't want others to post on your page. Some people will post on your page trying to sell you things. Some people may put mean or upsetting comments on your posts. When you go onto Facebook, you may see other people's posts that are upsetting to you. Next slide. However, in my opinion, the benefits of Facebook outweigh the problems with Facebook. As you see on the slide, many, many disability organizations are now on Facebook. It's a wonderful way to explore what is being done by lots and lots of organizations around the world that are interested in disability rights and self-advocate groups as well are all over Facebook. So like I said, the benefits, in my opinion, outweigh the problems. Next slide. Questions? Wait, what? I'm trying to go back. Oh. Sorry. Okay, Twitter. Another great way to make a difference on social media and get self-advocacy out there. So Twitter is very popular, but it has a big difference um, from Facebook in several ways. About 100 million people around the world use Twitter each day. In America, it is used much less than Facebook. But if you're trying to reach younger people or African Americans, they use Twitter more than other ages or races. Also, many more college educated people use Twitter. And so there's some resources on the um, advocacy training site to learn more about Twitter. So here's how some self advocates could use Twitter you can post links to stories about disability. You can post pictures about disability. You can post videos. You can retweet others' post pictures and videos. Next slide. If you have a smartphone, you can live tweet from your activities or of, of your activities or your self-advocacy events. You can post news, media, blog, or an organization's links about topics that interest you on your Twitter feed. You can follow disability rights actions on Twitter without attending them in person. You can tell people on Twitter when you see wrong words about disability used. And Twitter is being used for what they call live tweeting with a lot of disability actions when there's protests and things like that. So even if you can't go to the um, disability event or action, you can still follow along on Twitter and see how you can work and do some of the advocacy from your home as well. Next slide. But Twitter has some access problems. On Twitter, everything is written and must be within 140 characters, about 20 words plus a long website link. However, there is news that Twitter might be going to um, 10,000 characters, I believe. So wait and see, it might change to be a less um, restricted um, content area later on. Second, many tweets are not full sentences and use unfamiliar abbreviations, so may not be understandable. For example, sometimes instead of writing the word people, people write PPL. So you have to know what some of the abbreviations mean when they're using a lot of them in a tweet. Um, blind people or those with low vision may find it difficult to get screen readers to work on Twitter. Next slide. Easy Chirp is a web accessible alternative to Twitter, so it might be a way to access it better if you're using screen readers. It's designed to be simple to use. It's optimized for people who are disabled. It also works with keyboard only older browsers like IE8, low band internet connection and without JavaScript. Next slide. A number of disability organizations are on Twitter and it's a great way to get information. Even if you decide not to participate in tweeting, still you can go onto Twitter with an account 
and not have to participate, but you can see everybody else's um, posts and just get information that way. So the Autism Women's Network is on Twitter. Autistic Self-Advocacy Network is on Twitter. The Center for Disability Rights in New York State is on Twitter. Thinking Person's Guide to Autism is on Twitter. Down Syndrome Advocacy is on Twitter. So quite a number of um, self-advocacy and disability organizations are on Twitter. Next slide. Pinterest. Pinterest is a very interesting kind of part of social media and it's now being used by many people who have communication disabilities. For example, they can pin photos of things that they like on their Pinterest board and then they have their Pinterest board on their smartphone and so if they don't speak verbally they can show people on their smartphone information about themselves, things that they like or even I know people that use it when they go to restaurants and they have pictures of the food they like and they just show the waitress the food they like. So it's a very flexible image-based social media. And it also can be used for self-advocacy if you don't speak verbally. If you want to reach people who can understand pictures better than words, Pinterest is wonderful. Um, it's actually used more than Twitter. It's more popular with men than women and it's used by more Caucasian people. There's, again, more resources on the um, media training website. So for Pinterest, the thing to remember is that it's all about images. And so if you're working with people who understand information better in picture form, it's a great resource to use. Next slide. Instagram is also all pictures with some captions, but a lot of people will post pictures on Instagram without any captions. But it's a very good way to reach young people. More than half of adult Instagram users are under 30 years old. It is also much more used by Hispanic people and black people who are adults. You can learn more, more about Instagram from the um, training site. On the slide is an image of somebody's um, service dog, Delbert, um, somebody who puts his pictures up via his name, Disabled. And so if you're somebody who gets information better through images, Instagram might be a great way to um, you know, put yourself out there with images about your life and um, also look at other people's images. So I think it can be used for self-advocacy when photos tell the story best. Next slide. So video blogs are much easier to do these days. So they're also referred to as vlogs. And um, on this slide is a disability advocacy um, group called Real Girls. And several disabled girls are reviewing films at this website or on YouTube through their video blog. So you can tell your own story however you want it to be told using a video blog, which I think is very important. Um, and all you might need is a smartphone or a digital camera to make your video. So in the um, image on the slide, it's a screen grab of a YouTube video of two teen girls, one with brown hair and one with red hair and glasses, who discuss the ableism in an I am autism video. So it's a great way to critique things, do kind of your own movie reviews, talk about news events, whatever you want to talk about. Um, it's a great kind of way because no one can jump in there and change anything you're saying. You, it's you talking to everybody on YouTube and nobody is um, having any say in what you're saying. So I think it's a really excellent self-advocacy um, method. Next slide. So here's a list of ex some examples of video blogs by people with disabilities. Sharice living with cerebral palsy. Um, Prachena Russ discusses how to advocate for yourself to teachers in a disability awareness blog. For teachers, real girls that we saw the image of in the last slide. My Living My CP Life, um, Cody Keplinger is a blind writer who talks about disability writers, such as when she doesn't need help. Um, and Amethyst 
Shaver has a video series called Ask an Autistic. Really excellent ways to either for them to tell their stories or for you to learn about their lives as well. And I highly recommend looking at other people's video blogs before you start your own because they might give you a lot of really good ideas about how to tell your story through video. Any questions? Um, everybody's unmuted if um, they want to ask a question. Hi, this is Trina. Hi, Trina. Shit, shit. Trina. Um, I have a question. You know, you, you're showing lots of different ways that we can get our stories out there, um, but they all take a lot of time um, and a lot of. Um, really because it takes a lot of time so which is the most important do you think the most successful one that we can focus on and do you have any budgeting time budgeting tips on doing these things because I know a lot of people just get sucked into like Facebook and they're right. on Facebook 12 hours a day and then you're not really living your life yeah great question thanks Trina I would say that one way, if you're more afraid of kind of getting addicted to Facebook, that Twitter is a really good resource. You can kind of use it as a disability rights news feed. You can follow a bunch of people and organizations that are talking about disability rights and self-advocacy. And then you can just set up a time, you know, maybe 15 minutes each day that is going to be your Twitter time. And you just go and look and see what um, other people are posting. And then you can retweet what you think is interesting. You don't even have to spend time grabbing your own things to tweet. So I think Twitter is probably the least um, time consuming and also a lot of the things are already there. I know when I go on to Twitter, a lot of times I find myself just retweeting if I'm on my phone because I don't have access to you know, easy manipulation of the internet. But then when I go to post things myself, a lot of times they've already been posted and I just retweeted them all already. I think Twitter takes up the least time. Facebook, there was actually an article I saw just this morning about the usability of Facebook is going to be getting even better and better in the next few years. But apparently the fear that people have of Facebook is exactly what you were saying. People are afraid of getting addicted to Facebook. And I think the best way to handle that, I know that it's a real problem and that people can get addicted but you know just set aside a time you know I mean maybe 30 minutes you know each day when right before you're gonna fix dinner or whatever um, and that's gonna be your time you know 5 to 530 or whenever the the time you can carve out or right before you go to bed or whatever um, and I think if you put yourself on a little bit more of a schedule then um, maybe you won't get sucked into everything. But I know how easy it is. And so if you are really afraid of getting sucked in, I think Twitter is the one that, um, you know, you can just look at other people's information about what's going on. And a lot of news organizations are now, that's it's kind of like looking at a news wire service, looking at Twitter these days, depending on who you're following. So I think it's a great way in a very short amount of time to find out everything that's happening in the world and with disability rights, if that makes sense. Thank you. Sure. Other questions? Uh, hi, I was wondering where hi. is the website with all these links that you guys were talking about? Great question. It is called Autistic Advocacy Through Media WordPress.com. I believe um, my ASAN friends will be giving a link to everybody, correct? All the resources are there in much more detail on the um, website. If anybody can't find it, um, you can email me, email ASAN. We'll have links all over after the webinar. 
Okay, thanks. Sure. Other questions? Okay. Okay, we'll move on then. Okay, thank you. Next slide. Okay, public service announcements. So these, I think, are based on the question I just got about time management. I think these are much more helpful to be if they're done by actual organizations because they're going to be taking a little bit more time. So um, that, I think, is something really important to remember about PSAs is organizations because you really want them to look professional. It's fine if your video blog is just you talking, um, but for a public service announcement, you know, people are going to be sharing it possibly all over social media, so you really want to make an impact and um, have it look really professional. So the screen grab is one of my favorite PSAs from ASAN called Stop Combating Me, and it's animation, um, you know, calling out the people that would say, you know, the fighting words that are used about autism. So I think the importance for organizations to create public service announcements is really great because then social media like Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram can, you know, post these and they can go viral and you can really spread the word to a lot of people that may not know about your organization. So many self-advocacy and disability organizations create PSAs and the goal is really more to teach non-disabled people about disability topics in a way they will remember. So I think it's a really excellent way to reach out to people that may not know much about disability information. Next slide. Tumblr. So Tumblr is a social blogging site that is very popular with younger people under the age of 30. It has text, photos, audio, links, chats, and animated GIFs. It is used to promote many important issues in society. And I think it's, again, a great way to reach young people. Um, there's a big community of people who care about disability rights that are on Tumblr. And um, and the other important thing is that you don't have to tell people who you are on Tumblr. So um, some Tumblr pages are all pictures with no writing. Um, it's a very creative kind of site, so it can be a creative way for self-expression. And um, but everyone can see everything on Tumblr, and there's not privacy settings like on Facebook. So you know, make sure you know what you're doing. So here's some of the potential problems with Tumblr. It can be confusing because some sites have text, video, and audio playing all at the same time. It's very difficult to make accessible for screen readers because of all the different formats of the content that are happening on Tumblr. Um, people can hide on Tumblr and not tell you who they are. And we put people who are hiding who they are, they might be mean or rude to other people on Tumblr. There can be bullying on Tumblr because, again, people are hiding who they are, and so then they feel more free to be a bully. Next slide. But there are some great disability-related bloggers on Tumblr. The couple that we have here um, on the screen are Jensen Caraballo, Man on Wheels, he, he tumbles at gimpjensen.tumblr.com and Amethyst Shaver, NeuroWonderful, NeuroWonderfulTumblr.com. So, you know, there's a great diversity of different disability rights people on Tumblr. So if that's, if you like all the aspects of social media from video to print to images, it's kind of a one-stop shopping for everything there. Next slide. Online petitions, next slide. So online petitions are a little bit controversial <laughs> because a lot of people think they're going to get changes made with online petitions, but the problem is 
you can't ask people to do things that um, are illegal or violate rights in American um, law. So there's a great website, and a person named Salsa has created this website about how to do a good petition, or create a good petition, and um, so the screen image for this slide is of this new um, Muppet on Sesame Street, and people were voting for the new Muppet. So what Salsa says to do is first use words in the petition title that grab attention, add a picture that people will like to look at, clearly explain what the petition is for, meaning why should people sign the petition, help them tell their friends and followers on social media sites about the petition with buttons that let them share easily, show who signs the petition, that will encourage others to sign it, let the people who signed the petition tell why they signed it in the comments section. So again, back to the question about time management, setting a petition, setting a petition can be not that time consuming, but I think you should think long and hard before you set up a petition because it may be even spending time doing it for something that might not um, go viral or get a lot of signatures or if the signature, it might get a lot of signatures that still don't make it do any good. So next slide. So here are some of the problems. Petitions cannot change things if it is illegal to change them. In America, we have freedom of speech. So if a petition would stop someone else's freedom of speech, it won't work no matter how many signatures you have. So what this means is that if you're trying to create a petition to have people not use certain words, that is not allowed in the United States. Freedom of speech means that even really negative words are all allowed because they don't make a decision about one word being better than another word. Um, second, you can collect thousands of signatures on your petition, but it doesn't change anything. So um, it's a lot of work to and a lot of signatures, so it might be very upsetting to collect all these signatures that don't make any changes. Thousands of petitions are now out there on the internet, so it's also now very difficult to get people to notice your petition. Next slide. Other questions? Yeah, does anybody have any questions? They're all unmuted. Okay, that's not. Okay, everyone, thank you for coming. And this webinar will be posted on our YouTube. Um, if in probably a few weeks, we have to caption it. And um, again, thank you for coming. And thank you, Beth, for um, presenting. Thank you all for having it. And everybody, get the website and go explore. And it has my email there. If you have questions, just email me, and I'm happy to answer questions you have if you think of them later. This concludes our webinar. Thank you. All right.